We'll tell you any shit you want to hear. Multi-armed deities. Twisted and gyrated in provocative and sensual fashion. There is no future. So why not just burn the whole fucking thing down? People are so evil. I wish I could find a Hitler of today and go kill him. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Welcome to the Nostalgia Trap AMFM. This podcast is produced by robot historians in the near future, working in an abandoned mine shaft deep beneath the surface of a destroyed planet. Through space and time, the robots collect recordings of various humans attempting to make sense of a rapidly collapsing political and social situation. Now let's listen to the voices from inside a broken empire as it sputters out its last desperate breaths. This episode is brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts Snickerdoodle Croissant Donut and Caramel Cheesecake Square. Time to make the donuts. Please enjoy. Well, I don't think either one of us are experts on Aleppo. and, and I mean... Everybody who uh, I feel like a lot of people claim authority on these things, um, particularly uh, people that are making some sort of ideological point, And I am always distrustful of it because I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know what to think about what's happening in Aleppo. I mean, when did you become aware of what's happening there? Well, I mean, I think that uh, if you go back to our, some of our topical fever episodes, one of them was about Syria. Yeah. And that's something I'd like to re- go back and listen to because I think it was 2009. Damn. So, I mean, it's been going on for a long, long time. Time 2009, that can't be right. Maybe 2011. Maybe but, 10 or 11. Yeah, yeah. but it's been, a, uh-huh. I guess it's been a while. Yeah. Um, what, 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 maybe do you remember tw- anything that we would have been saying about it? It must have been 2013. There is this thought that, see, okay, so I have this thought in my head and it, and, and I, and I like, I like, uh, I like this thought and I don't know if it's correct. I mean, I, I, my idea is that it's close to correct, but I like it because it fits my narrative and it probably fits yours too, but that Syria has something to do with climate change. Oh, right? for sure. Yeah. And, and actually, uh, one guy you should interview is my friend Jared Scott, who mm. just directed this film, The Age of Consequences. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's about how the military is planning its strategies around climate change. Mm. And the military uh, sees this entire Syrian crisis, the U.S. military sees this entire Syrian crisis as uh, instability that was set off because of climate change, because of uh, water shortages and a lack of water resources and fighting over water resources in Syria due to a climate change induced drought. Yes. And so in which a lot of people from the from the rural areas of the country fled into the cities to escape the effects of the drought. And that's where the heart of the kind of political differences that led to the current war Mm -hmm. really started cropping up is overcrowded cities as a result of climate change. I'm sure that's part of it. Yeah. And, you know, I wish I knew more of the story, but you should definitely have Jared on actually to talk. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, And I think that for liberals and Mm -hmm. conservatives, the fight seems to be over things like uh, should Obama have talked about that red line and then when the chemical weapons were deployed, should he have put in U.S. military power. Yeah. Clinton wanted a no-fly zone. So one of the things that would have happened if she was elected is that there would be a no-fly zone. Um, The Syrian crisis led to the migration crisis into Europe, which has given rise to like the kind of right-wing Europe, fortress Europe, the rise of the right, uh, the terror attacks associated with ISIS. Yes. uh, Merkel as the last liberal standing. Yeah. And and, and, and you and I have talked about this a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Europe is kind of... And Syria is kind of the first... The first like n- n- new acceleration of this right. of this thing, um, but it's been it's been going on for a while. But Europe is is kind of the front lines of 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 the blowback. They're feeling the blowback of American foreign policy before America, and for sure. And it's also really complicated things between Turkey in the EU and Turkey in Germany. Yeah, and I, I think accelerated Turkey's turn towards uh, autocracy and the consolidation of power in Erdogan. And so uh, the Syrian crisis had ripple effects on basically every continent. And the fact that Obama letting in the 10,000 refugees was a campaign issue for Trump. Mm. uh, And now Trump claims that he's right because the guy uh, attacked the folks in the Christmas square. In Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in, in a weird way, a lot of the Syrian crisis is a rhetoric around containment, control, uh, contamination, uh, concealment, 
uh, paternalism. And it's all about the ways that like rich industrial or post-industrial countries can uh, protect the refugees that are coming out of Syria yeah, or the yeah. way that they can understand the migration crisis um, as something to be sympathetic for mm, or something mm-hmm. to be scared about. Um, and it's a lot uh, more complicated with the kind of uh, the Aleppo crisis of, of, the, of this past month yeah. when we've been getting hundreds, I would say, of streamed images from inside the bombarded city yeah. of people basically giving you know their last statements you know live on Twitter final or live Twitter on messages uh, mm-hmm. Facebook live testimonials that I've seen of fa- terrified fathers um, basically talking about being ki- about to like they're about to be killed with that, their families that's right. um, I mean it, it's it's weird because you I think a couple like I don't know like a month ago I, I texted you something along the lines of that you know there will be uh, we'll have an Anne Frank you know, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if, if, if there were, you know, social media during World War II, Anne Frank would have been an Instagram star. And, mm-hmm. and it's like, that's what we're seeing. That, 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 that closing of that history is really, really chilling. Yeah, and I think that... To watch unfold. Comparing it to World War II is interesting too because I still see occasionally within the cup, uh, coverage of Aleppo, people saying, this wasn't supposed to happen again. And referring to Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Yeah. And yeah, it wasn't supposed to happen. Or again. even Kosovo. Yeah. But that yeah. whole, that never again rhetoric, I, I'm, I'm not even sure why it's still being deployed. It, it's completely ineffective and doesn't work. And I also feel like there's a lack of. And an, it's just not true. That's right. There's a lack of analysis. We're not willing to, we're not willing to, to intervene in a way. And, and it's weird because, I don't know, this, 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 uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but it made me think about this kind of like idea of like, um, calling for intervention right. as some sort of like moral response to this 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 tragedy right and mm-hmm. what's going what's unfolding mm-hmm. and and we see that you know i've i've seen that in that there, there's this line between kind of like wanting to do something mm-hmm. and like being a warmonger right yeah i agree and it's 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 an interesting way that people relate to conflict because we we do see i mean quite helpfully i understand the impulse here and i you know we, we see the impulse to donate to the blue helmets and you know white helmets blue helmets the, i thought they were like the kind of peacekeepers or yeah. some sort of international force i honestly don't quite know but it was i think gonna, you might be talking about the white helmets that the are white the dudes helmets, that okay. like go and rescue people then in bombs sure. but maybe there are blue it, helmets it, you know too. and it could be any number of groups yeah like ngos it sounds like fucking star wars shit But it is a nice contrast yeah. to the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s when people actually, and this was, you know, men and women um, across Europe and even from North America, you know, went over and fought the fascists. Yes. Well, it's an interesting conundrum because... And the left, it's like a big part, like, in the, Amer- the American left is proud of the, like, fact that so many American leftists volunteered to go fight fascists in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Um... It's it's a big part of left history in a weird way, and there's this like, I don't know how you feel about this, but this kind of like left bravado and machismo that comes out when they're like with fascists rise up. We've seen it like with Trump all of a sudden. All I have like especially like leftist men I've seen on social sure. media that are like, I'm ready, like I'm ready to kick the ass of any fascist that tries to fucking you know get in the way of transgender rights or you know it's it's this weird kind of couching of like or this weird kind of mixture of progressive values and violence well i, I mean I'll and that's what, i mean that's obama i would, like, I would, I would contained I would, right well uh, there's a difference though because i would savor the violence but i would also savor the resistance because i've heard it from men and women like standing up for people that are being attacked and harmed like on the mm-hmm. subway or etc i've noticed it across uh people's i guess gender identifications that there is this element of if someone's being attacked i'm gonna step in yeah i feel that way too and i so i don't necessarily think of it as machismo although it could very well be that yeah but i also think that's a complete you know and that's why i I brought up the spanish civil wars it's a different way to relate to conflict which Mm. is to say i'm going to put myself in harm's way and so i think that people have decided for any number of Probably very Which good. is a different idea than I'm going to hurt somebody. Or that my yeah. state needs to intervene for its imperial reasons. Right, right. You know, so like it wasn't that the U.S. military won a victory in the Spanish Civil War or actually lost anything. It was that people went over there and tried to help 
create a pocket of freedom from fascism yep. themselves. And they actually went off to fight outside their government. That's something today that we associate with a quote unquote radical Islam so that people will step into conflicts mm. uh, or step into conflict zones from nations that where those conflicts aren't taking place. So like in Afghanistan during the uh, Afghan war, you know, you would say like, oh, we found fighters from X number of countries. But when you look at the post-industrial countries, the global north, the rich countries, they're just volunteer military countries. You don't have people kind of going over like you did in Spain. And I'm not saying you should go to Syria and fight against Assad, but I am saying it's just a different way to imagine the relationship. And yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. it's actually a turning point in a lot of people that they're saying, I will stand up for people that are being harmed yeah. around me. That's a different... I didn't want to shit that's... on that impulse. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to shit on was the kind of like gross kind of... I mean, the way that that, that impulse taps into some really ugly, uh, ugly shit. Well, for sure. Right? For sure. I totally get that. Yeah. And I think it comes back to Aleppo too because uh, I think people genuinely feel sorrow and horror yeah. at those images that we were talking about. Who could? I, I think you're inhuman if you don't, mm -hmm. right? But I also think that there's something happening in terms of technology and mm -hmm. our relationship to technology. There's something happening about uh, race yeah. and skin color. Um, I think there's something happening with English in, in part two. Um, and I Are you talking about like the fact that, and I think, I think this is a thought that's come up between you and I before, perhaps not on this show, but the idea that, you know, for lack of a better term, like black bodies are displayed at, black and brown bodies are displayed very prominently as dead bodies and tortured bodies and 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 kind of like oppressed and mutilated bodies on social media all the time and employed as a kind of almost like a political language there's something happening is what i would say yeah because the i mean black lives matter comes out of that the fact that mike brown's body laid in the street right. for four hours right for sure that political mo movement was born because of a body it, being that's and, right. and, and and the outrage that could be shared over that that's right right and i think if you're pointing out that certain certain crises give way to certain kinds of spectacular violence and dead bodies or dying bodies dead and dying bodies if you look to see how that circulated it's there's just something structural happening mm. where there's a trafficking in these images and videos and i'm not going to point to the the kind of uh way that these videos are being shared but i would point to the fact that when you and analyze this structurally there's something up yeah with the fact that facebook and twitter are uh, public companies and they make money every time that those images and videos are shared and there's something up with the fact that uh, one's access to forms of quote unquote live technology, Facebook Live, Twitter Live, um, that one's access to that technology over determines the creation of public sympathy for that kind of spectacular violence. And I'm, so that's not to analyze the violence or to say that injustice isn't happening, but it is to say if you look at the places where the populations go dark, so mm -hmm. Venezuela, mm -hmm. South Sudan, most particularly Yemen you can see that there are populations undergoing maybe not Aleppo style crises, although in Yemen, I would argue they are. And in South Sudan, I would argue that they have been. Venezuela, you're under, you're undergoing a much more slow kind of, you know, economic contortion, which people are, are very much suffering. But where's the absence of the live video? So in other words, I think that you have acute crises mm. on the scale of Syria taking place in maybe three or four or more hotspots, as well as the overwhelming number of populations around the planet in places like, you know, Nigeria, you know, that are in conflict with Boko Haram, where you have extreme suffering, where either people's videos aren't being distributed, um, whether because they're not profitable, I don't know, or people's lack of access to technology, the there's no English language, or it's the black and brown bodies thing. I'm I'm a little suspicious about why certain bodies are trafficked and others aren't. Mm, and I'm saying yeah. this as someone who has been That's caught, crazy caught up in this. And I'm also suspicious that, you know, I read a critique around when the... when the So you, you're saying that it might not just be market forces that are controlling uh, what bodies are, are what, what like splattered bodies are visible on Facebook. Or, or is all market forces? Like what is controlling this? In other what, words, what, like what you just suggested is that there's something... 
there's some there's some like kind of underlying reason why we're seeing some bodies and not others. There, there's got there's, there's got to be. Yeah. And I don't know the the full answer to that. But what I, what I would say is when people say there's something wrong with the U.S. giving for profit military contracts to companies that make five percent, ten percent, fifteen, twenty percent margins, let's say huge profit margins off of the instruments of death. I find it to be an immense moral contradiction when someone like Mark Zuckerberg, who is essentially revered both for his donations to charity and for building a technology that brings the world together. Yes. Well, how are you bringing the world together? Because every time that those videos go viral, you're incrementally making millions more dollars to add to your billions, and you're not giving that money away necessarily. And if you are, you're giving to the charities of your choosing, and you're not doing anything to eradicate the inequality that's structural in the, in the global capitalist system. But more to the point, why isn't there like a nonprofit utility internet, a nonprofit utility social media company where you can feel free to at least um, share images that are horrible without knowing that it's benefiting advertisers and clicks? So in other words, it's very strange to me, very strange, that in the age of user produced content, that people are putting forward images of death unlike anything we've ever seen before and that this is now these new media companies, these social media companies have found a way to profit off of this, but that's not part of the conversation at all. Whereas when you look at television companies, and what there are and are, they're not allowed to, to, to produce on channels in terms of sex and violence. Yeah. The nightly news is not allowed for censorship reasons to traffic in the same images of death in the same kinds of ways. Right, right. But they are allowed on these internet companies who are taking advantage basically of some sort of either moral, technological, legal, uh, corporate loopholes to make money off of these trafficking of these images. And I, I just find that deeply problematic. Yeah, disturbing as fuck. And, and the idea that, um, you know, it is... It is certain certain bodies we're gonna see dying, and certain ones we're not. Um, and there's a political edge to that, and it's particularly when companies like Twitter and Facebook are are invested in the national security state 100. percent So you have like, for instance, it makes me think of the fact that Chelsea Manning is currently being essentially tortured to death in mm -hmm. prison. This episode was recorded before Chelsea Manning was released from prison, which was literally the only remotely good thing to happen in the otherwise bleak, unrelenting nightmare of 2017. For um, giving out information about a lot of different things that are going to be shared on this program. But one of the things that she shared that was on WikiLeaks um, is a, a, a video of American troops firing on and killing a number of civilians mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan. I believe, think it's Afghanistan um, and and killing uh, a number of children. And this video uh, is 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 part of the the evidence being used against Chelsea Manning to to, to give her a, a, a life sentence in prison. Mm hmm. In other words, that that video, you know, like, uh, why is that video so, you know, such a such a uh, a kind of suppressed piece of the uh, of 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 the evidence of what's going on in the world, while videos of say, you know, civilians in Aleppo are well, let's are let's, shared so freely. And that's it seems right. Like you're right. There is there's there's political and monetary interest behind what bodies we see suffering. That's right. Yeah, and, and, and that's and that's it, that's hard. And it clearly benefits, like the the images of suffering in Syria clearly benefit certain neoliberal and regime narratives that take place in the United States that have to do with uh, pre-Trump Russia and uh, U.S. interests in the Middle East. In well, other, like, I mean these these images do. I mean, I think it's almost an admission from the state that these images, the state, and I, and when I say the state, I mean as represented by Twitter and Facebook. That mm -hmm. that these images do have power, um, and that the ones that are they they they're, they have a power to shape a narrative. So whenever I see certain images being spread a lot, I kind of have the feeling that I'm seeing power expressing something to me. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a reason why I don't see a lot of videos of prisoners being force fed in Guantanamo. Right, mm -hmm. like I don't see them on Facebook. I've I've never and like you can find those. There are videos of Guantanamo shit that are unbelievable, but they're very hard to find. You got to really seek them out, and so it makes me think that y you're right. There is some sort of like force behind who controls the, our access and our and our kind of ability to see the visibility of these things. If that makes sense. Yeah, and you know it sounds paranoid, but 
uh, another way to look at it too is well, this is deep politics. Yeah, so. the way that the crisis comes in waves, so that you know, like the during the when the, when the family was in the boat that was going into Greece or, or yeah, Europe, right, and, right, right, and, and the and the children washed ashore. Yeah, and you know that was something that, that really fucked with me. Oh, everybody, I think. And when I, I was yeah, I was going to bring that up. And when I read critiques of that, it was saying stuff like you know one of the functions of these images for people like you, Justin, is that it reminds you of your own privilege both white privilege and your global privilege yeah. your northern privilege your gringo privilege that one of the things that you understand by looking at those images is you feel how safe you are yep and it makes you it gives you that imperial security and it's a way to tell you hey at least that's not me right at least that's not my son and thank god that's not me which actually insulates you more from the crimes and insulates you more from that world. You know, and it's like being uh, uh, lazy, drunk, <laughs> laying on the couch at night, unemployed in America, watching TV, flipping through the channels, and you see infomercials of either puppies and kittens being tortured with Sarah McLaughlin. In the Images of African kids with flies in their face, which would dominated the infomercials of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that the the person that sees those images and and flicks through them on the on, on the couch at night is actually being reassured in some way. And what's my and impulse? That, yeah, donate money. Yeah, which is which I did. Right. And then it's like, oh, I'm a good person. Yeah, because I'm donating money. You know, and there's something heinous about that. And I think that I'm speaking from a very specific site of privilege. Mm, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is true for everyone who's dealing in the way that these images are trafficked. Yeah, yeah. But it, I think it is true for me. And I don't I don't know what happens if you think to yourself, oh, the, the revelation can't just be... There is suffering there and is I'm suffering not a part of it. Because and, what that that's like yeah. the old Baldwin line. And what that's telling me back is that you know, my own racial innocence. Mm. You know, what it's given back to me is the is a is a is a cold shower yes. that says you're safe. The way of the future. You're clean. The way of the future. You're not to blame. The way of the future. You're okay. The way of the future. And it's a form of therapy. And I I I think that form of death therapy, that snuff therapy is um, something that I don't have the capabilities or resources to like fully understand and comprehend. But I do know that um, it's part of a uh, like a deep seated problem mm. with my relationship, not only to my state and um, my, 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 my job and my life um, and my country and to the planet and to the people who are suffering. It, that that's that all that goes without saying i think it's also a deeply problematic relationship to technology yeah and what i understand happening with hashtag these, snuff therapy oh good with these waves of acute crises so like the the kids wash up on the beach and then the war resides mm, mm -hmm. uh and, and and goes back into low tide yeah and then high tide comes back with aleppo and now it's low tide again yeah where are the videos now right in other words right you know it's not just that some paranoid force is causing those images to all be circulated at one time, but they're clearly coming in waves, not necessarily by direction, but because that virality should be telling collectively, should be telling us something about the nature of technology, the nature of news cycles. Mm. And I would also argue the nature of the avant-garde, the nature of art, yeah, the yeah, nature yeah. of movements, the way that history gets written live first. So like, you know, Oswald, who I would, tell me if I'm wrong, isn't that the first assassination on live TV? I think so, yeah. And so yeah, yeah. that sets off the era, kind of like the nuke sets off the era uh -huh. that we were talking about on the other show. Some sort of portal was opened in terms of the way that people relate to media. That's the, right. The people that relate to violence. That's right. And it gets picked up with Tiananmen Square in 1989. There's mm -hmm. something about seeing people struggling for their life or dying in real time. Yeah that somehow intensifies what we call history or the first draft of history. Uh -huh. 
and then it recedes back. And I and here's the thing where and, I, and, and, and in the meantime, we've created technology that allows us to kind of see, have eyes, and see live right. everywhere. That's right. Yeah. If you think about War of the Worlds, that fake Orson Welles invasion on the radio, yes. people say that's as much about the radio as anything else. People say the Ruby Oswald killing was as much about black and white television as anything else. Right. Just like the Civil Rights Movement. People say that. Uh, Tiananmen Square was as much about cable news and the fax machine as anything else. The effect of TV, the message of TV, is quite independent of the program. That is, there is a huge technology involved in TV which surrounds you physically. And the effect of that huge service environment on you personally is vast. The effect of the program is incidental. People will say that Aleppo was much about Twitter mm, mm-hmm. as it was about the people suffering. And yeah. so I think that what you're seeing here is technologically created uh, portals. You're seeing te- yeah. technological m- waves of modernity. Mm, and the mm-hmm. problem with that is, is that not only are we not able to sympathize, identify with, mobilize, or activate for people who are suffering in, in the dark areas, the areas that aren't live. Yeah. 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 But we're also unable and quickly forget that suffering once it's passed because it's no longer acute. And what I wonder about is once you get past the moment of, of the live death, what happens to memory? What happens to the ethics of memory? What happens to remembrance? What happens to all the memorials that were never built yeah. for all the people that we watch die live and then forgot? Yeah. yeah. And so as someone who spends a lot of time in the past and looking at, People that died in the past for which there's no testimony and no language and no words. And no live video. Yeah. I'm really kind of, um, I'm troubled by the fact that even in death, there's privileged subjects whose deaths are remembered. Mm. And there's, there's so many subjects whose deaths, either because they weren't recorded or they're not sympathetic somehow, are pushed outside of the zones of even like cursory memory. And yeah, I, yeah. you know, look at the POW camps in World War II. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Hmm. Like, oh, 200,000 Soviet troops died in this Nazi run camp, like in this country during this month of this year during World War II. And it's like, man, I don't think I've ever heard of a book in English being written about the m- millions, hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops that died in POW camps. Right, right. It's outside the technology of memory and identification and sympathy. And that, that really kind of troubles me. Yeah, and, 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 and what you're seeing is that, that template of memory being expressed in real time through the, through the structures of Twitter and Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, that, 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 that there are bod- bodies that matter more than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and it, it's weird because it, it's a weird kind of reversal almost of Black Lives Matter because like Black Lives Matter emerges out of this idea of like, you know, black bodies matter, mm-hmm. you know, and that, and that, you know, what we talked about with Mike Brown laying in the street for four hours was seen as was, was kind of universally recognized within certain communities as a disgrace. Right. Mm-hmm. And that like, in order to make that body matter, we've got to, um, we've got to change the, the society in some way. Right. Mm-hmm. It's particularly addressing the way that police, uh, uh, relate to the black community. But, but what's interesting about that is then we see this kind of like sh- this rain of images of black bodies being destroyed again and again and again. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that I only know Eric Garner as a guy that's being choked to death, that I've seen that image over and over and over again, and it punches me every time I see it. Mm-hmm. But the fact that that's my only, my only relation to Eric Garner is like his last tortured moments. Mm-hmm. There's something fucked about that, too. I, I, right? com- I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's why I, I would agree with you that on the one hand, Black Lives Matter is a model. It's it's an amazing model for what we're kind of talking about in terms of this politics of remembrance in real time. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly... Yeah, say her a, name, say his name, uh, right? Yeah, it's a, it's, I, it's, I would actually argue it's almost revolutionary. Yeah. It's remarkable in its... In its it deserves to be... Com- it's remarkable how little time. our president commented upon it. That's... Yeah. Well, and that's that might be another you yeah. know, topic. Yeah. But what I would agree with you also to say is there's also something really fucked up about the fact that the way people are taught to care mm. about black bodies are in moments of acute violence. Yeah. Acute crisis in these in these horrible videos and that it 
it's like being it's like a body being shocked back into existence that's on the verge of a heart attack mm. you know it's like people are being they're having their guts pumped yeah and by that i mean the audience like you must be in a state of insulated shock yeah if it takes those images and a movement that stops traffic and chants in your face and causes so much uh, interruption to your day, you know, like day life, like yeah, yeah. all those things are things I agree should be happening. But it must be like the country must be asleep mm, mm-hmm. if it cannot comprehend these kinds of basic level uh, stories about human rights and dignity. And injustice it, 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 that are very easy to understand, and you shouldn't need a uh, a snuff film shown to you on live streaming video over and over and over again in order to understand that. And, and maybe my idea of the audience is wrong. Yeah, you know, but I, I don't know. It's really tricky. It, it's, it's, really it's really hard. Tricky. Because I mean, it is it, like the videos are part of this awakening that's happening, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they're 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 deeply the, the 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 fact that this is what it takes for the awakening to happen. Um, at the same time that that maybe this isn't even an awakening, right? Well, I, it, well, I would I would say that it is, but I would also say remember the dark zone. Yeah. So how many times have you seen a video come out of a prison? Right, right. You know, we've seen some stuff in Rikers that was recorded on video yeah. where people were charged and everything, but... You, you know, know what you see of prison stuff is like very uh, like very carefully controlled documentaries on MSNBC and things like that. Oh yeah, and I've watched, right? I've tried to find all of them on Netflix. Oh yeah, I've, I, uh, that that stuff is incredible to me. Spring Creek Correctional Center, Alaska's only maximum security prison. It's the end of the road in America's final frontier. But you're but it's it's it, as you know, I mean in the same in the same way as like Twitter or Facebook. I mean, this is being like Pretty carefully cultivated by a, a multinational corporation. That's right, and also with, with kind of uh, deep interest in in maintaining the status quo when it comes to this stuff. It's true, and I guess one the final thing that I would say on this topic for now is there must be something intimate about how we train ourselves to hear certain scripts and only care about certain scripts because the script of "You care about me most when I'm dying" does sound like cinema. Yeah, and it does yeah. sound like television. In right. fact, it sounds like melodrama. Yeah, and it sounds like opera. And so, I don't know if this is about like a kind of a Western tradition of narrative. Be- you know, going back to at least Shakespeare, in which the moment of catharsis is a moment of violence and self recognition and knowledge, or if narrative itself is telling us something about our collective psychological selves that we are asleep through Act Four and yeah. only come alive for the. The, the blood that, that that concludes Act 4 and that leads into the denouement of Act 5. Yeah, In yeah, other words, why is it that we're only awake for Act 4? What the fuck is happening, Acts 1 through 3, mm. right now yeah, yeah. that we're not going to see until the chain link fence is being rattled and the screams are in our ears? Jesus Christ, that was some dark shit. But there is something so beautiful about human beings when they finally realize that there is no way out of the prison they made for themselves. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for more Nostalgia Trap AM FM, and please visit patreon.com slash nostalgia trap.